Hello. Hey guys, thanks for uh, staying up real late with me tonight. Um, I don't know how long this is supposed to go, and I don't want to go too super long, so I'm going to talk a little fast so we can actually get to bed at a decent hour. Um, and I'd like to know a little bit about you, because I wrote this presentation for a different audience, and I know that we're here at Node PDX, and you guys have you know a pretty uh, wide background. So talk to me here. Who here would consider themselves sort of like back-end engineers, Node engineers in the room? Okay. Who here is a little more front-endier? All right. Who here doesn't use JavaScript? All right, my people. <laughs> um, my name's Chris. I work at a place called Phase 2 Technology. We're an agency, and we do kind of like everything. Um, we're actually mainly a Drupal and a PHP shop, but like most places that are realizing they need to keep up to date, uh, we're doing a lot more JavaScript and a lot more uh, React and Node as well. So. Um, I've frequently run into problems in the Drupal space and in the, the content management space of people building big UI apps and they say, okay, um, well, we have a problem and we, we're going to manage state. We're going to do what we need to do in, in the UI. And generally, there's things like jQuery usually involved at that point. So they're going to make their own state system. And then they have two problems. Because when we go and we start messing around with DOM, uh, what we don't know is that we're trying to shove state into HTML. Um, this is just a little bit of a little bit of jQuery here. Who here can tell me how many pieces of state we're either checking for or setting in these couple of lines of good old jQuery? Just throw something out there. Like, what are we, what are we tracking or setting? Are you, you got five? Okay, here, hit me, hit me with something. Okay, all right, there's, there's a bunch of states. Um, is there specific things you, th you can um, divine that we're trying to, to check for? Oh, is it Larry? I'm sorry, I, I have better, darker. <laughs> what we've got here is just from reading classes, which is kind of the classical way that we, we checked on for state, um, we're checking to see if we're on the desktop version of the header, maybe, um, that we are, that there's a current active trail set, okay, um, or even that our subnav, uh, we need to make sure that we set it to be active, right? And this is the common way that we've had to manage uh, front end stuff. And it gets really gnarly, really, really quick. I think anybody that's been on a, on a JavaScript front end project can attest to that. So, any time that you're messing with these things, you're shoving things that you need to know about your application into a very mutable place, a very dangerous place. Um, and honestly, I think for front-end apps, after a certain point, the hardest thing to manage isn't necessarily, you know, um, libraries or, or um, you know, maybe. Uh, other parts, uh, bigger parts of an application, it's just managing like what the heck, what state are we in? I clicked a button and it changed something over here, or I went and I, I mutated something over here and now my drop down is showing for some reason, right? That's, these are things that we've kind of uh, had to juggle in the asynchronous nature of JavaScript for a really, really long time. So um, I like to get to code within the first five slides of every presentation I do, so I'd like to actually just pull up a little tiny Redux application right now and let's just look at the code first, and then we'll get into what we're actually seeing. Um, so let's take a look at this. I've got a little counter, and I'm just gonna hit plus, 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 minus, 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 and now I've got a little incrementer that only increments if it's an odd number, a little bit of logic, okay? And we're gonna do something asynchronously. I clicked a bunch, it waited a little bit, and then it counted up, right? Real simple application. Um, well, what's cool is, I'm actually gonna pull this up over here to show some of the tooling that we get with Redux, okay? We can see that we've got some kind of logging built into this concept, right? Just uh, available very, very easily. Let's look at the code that makes this happen. 
So we got our HTML. We've got a very basic concept of the things we can do and what changes. We'll talk about reducers in a bit, but all I want you guys to do is skim this and just kind of let it wash over you what we're seeing, right? We've got a very clear, we're incrementing something and then we're returning a state plus, a decrement, and a state minus, and a, just a good old fashioned state, okay? Not rocket science, very readable. Um, we are gonna build things called stores. These are places that we go to put state, we ask for state, and then we signal changes against. And then all we really know, all we need to know is that we're going to fire off these, we're going to dispatch events that have a certain shape that cause our state to change, right? And what we want is we want, um, we want our UIs to be very reactive. We want to change data and then have a front end that just responds to that fact. We all, who here's written React, right? Who here prefers Vue instead? What? Yeah, all right, okay. I'm a Vue guy myself. All right. <laughs> right, so I want to change data and then I want the ugly HTML stuff, I want that to handle kind of as a response to my data changing or the events um, of the data changing, right? We can even go, you know, throw a little logic inside of um, some of our application and then set, you know, various asynchronous um, um, events that we want to track. So the important thing here is that everything I can do in this application is documented. I have a place I can go to and just see, what can my application do? Pull up my reducer, scroll to the top. Pretty straightforward, right? Now, this gets crazy and we'll get into, um, we'll get into the craziness of that here in just a little bit. Okay, so. A little bit better than writing a uh, to-do app. Everyone's written 100 to-do apps in their front-end applications. All right, so right, all you really need to know, if there's one big takeaway today, Redux is a reliable, that's the important word here, reliable state container. Um, also makes testing a whole lot easier. So um, the goal here is writing code that we can take apart and test external to just the way it looks in browser, just the way it's, it ends up as HTML or uh, native, depending on uh, what you're building. Um, so let's talk about the frameworks and where Redux fits inside of all of the things that are out there, right? Um, we all know React, it's mostly just a template, it's a view layer, right? It's a view engine. You can do logic, absolutely, in React, uh, not recommended for anything uh, non-trivial, right? Same with a view. However, when you throw React against Redux, you've got a whole lot of tools at your disposal. Vue has its own version of Redux they call Vuex, it's the exact same thing. Um, once you learn one of these, you've, you can translate over into all these other data flow libraries. And then all the other stuff that's there. Um, okay, just to be clear, we know Redux is not React. As a matter of fact, um, I've used Redux uh, in a lot of non-React projects. I've used Redux with jQuery. It actually makes jQuery a whole lot easier to stomach uh, once you've got some kind of consistency there, right? However, there are very, very elegant integrations to React, which we'll take a look at real quick. Um, we mentioned this earlier. Uh, where did it come from, right? This is why I was shaking my hand in the back. Uh, it is mostly an implementation of the Flux architecture. There's some really good reading down there, Flux in-depth overview. Yet another thing Facebook kind of invented and then kicked out into the world and said, go make beautiful things with this. Um, really important thing here is the unidirectional nature of data flow. Uh, who here has written Angular 1 code? Yes, what was, the, what was the big selling point of Angular 1 when it first came out? Two-way data binding, right? It was like, I clicked this and this changed, and I clicked, ah, oh, and I changed over here. And it was amazing, right? And you're just changing shit all over the place. And one of the things that we rapidly figured out about Angular was two-way data flow sucks after a while, right? Like, it gets out of control. We don't know why things are happening, and then we had all of these constructs in the Angular 1 days of, you know, how you're subscribing to services and how we can bring control to this thing that was a feature and not a bug. And then people were like, maybe this two-way two -way data binding thing isn't so hot, right? So these flux architectures, and there's a lot of them out there, um, uh, 
really make it extremely strict and disciplined on how you signal you're going to make a change, how the change goes into the system, and how that change is uh, recorded and then responded to. A lot of boilerplate, very much worth it. Anyone here Elm, ELM fans? Anyone know Elm? Elm, I fell in love. I fell in love with Elm last summer a lot. Um, and in the Redux documentation, they have a prior art section, and they really give a big shout out to Elm. Redux would not exist without all of the work that went into Elm. If you ever want a beautiful, strongly typed, purely functional language, take a look at Elm. It's wonderful. Got a deck on that if anyone wants to see it. All right, um, cool. Redux popular. Awesome. So let's get into this unidirectional data flow just a little bit more, right? Um, when you've got only one direction your data can go, you've got expectations that you can set. You've got easier debugging. We can track, uh, track issues down a lot faster, okay? So everything starts from you know, some state. We're going to work in the HTML space. If you guys are native, that's cool too. Um, I say from my HTML, I'm going to trigger an action, capital A action, okay? For instance, we're going to go call an API. We're going to say, hey, uh, action, go get data, right? We click a button. We get a response back, which triggers a response success action. Yes, you fire actions for the start of things and the end of things, OK? And it comes back, and it's got a payload on it, right? So we've got an action that has a shape of what it is and the stuff, the data that it carries. We then run this action through what's called a reducer. And the reducer says, what type of action are you, and what do I need to do to the state based on that information? OK? So the store sees that we dispatched it. We ran the reducer. The reducer is then responsible for taking state, applying the change, and returning a new state. We never, ever, ever mutate state. The first thing most people think of or the first thing most people ask is they say, isn't that very inefficient memory-wise? Aren't we going to bloat um, state that is just basically being copied over and over and over again? The answer is no. Uh, the V8 engine is very, very efficient about garbage collection around state that is no longer directly being referenced. So you can copy and return state all you want all day long, and uh, uh, you won't see very uh, intense memory usage. Okay. The store updates, and when the store updates, we then bring in the power of you, React, jQuery, and we make our HTML changes based on that fact, okay? It's that simple. And so data really can only go one way, um, and that is very simple and very cool. Any questions so far? Sweet, all right. Um, we talked about actions. All an action is, it's just an object. It's got a key called type. Does it have to be called type? Nope. Can be called whatever you want. That's just the uh, that's just kind of the uh, the standard that we've got, right? You have a type, and then you have various pieces of data that you might want to go along with that uh, that particular action. That's it. The only way you can do things is by flinging these objects around your application. Okay. Reducers uh, take in actions. Okay, through the constructs that we build, and they just simply do. Switch statements. I mean, switch, takes, switch statements are back, right? When was the last time you wrote a switch statement on purpose, right? Well, it's really the only way you can do this. And in a way, it's a form of sneaky typing, right? If the only things I can do can only be found in a switch statement, sort of like poor man's typing right there, right? Like we can't do stuff that we're not allowed to find inside of our, our switch, right? So you get this very, uh, very simple. Um, very simple case where you do take, uh, you do return a copy of the state without mutating it directly. Super important. And uh, yeah, I'm throwing around the word pure function here. Um, anyone write in functional, well, we mentioned Elm earlier, or any other uh, purely functional languages out there besides you know, JavaScript? It's not purely functional, but it can be functional. The whole point is it takes an argument and it returns, uh, it returns a value. That's it. That's pretty much the only definition of uh, functional that we need to work with. And it makes things very testable and very um, we can set expectations. All right. So um, I have a little thing on reducing here. I don't know if we need to get into it super in depth, but 
I never, would, as, as I got into Redux and I started learning more about Elm, I realized I had never used the dot reduce function on purpose in my life. Who here has looked at a problem in JavaScript and said, I need dot reduce to you? Okay, this guy over here. You use it? Okay. Who here used dot map, right? Or, or dot filter? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Who here has said, I have a collection of things. I need to boil these down to one thing, right? It takes a little bit, right? The whole concept of reducers, it's the same thing, right? You've got things that are popping into this, this stack, and you're just returning a single representation over and over and over and over again, for sure. But that's definitely what you're doing. So uh, you can check that code pen or just go to the MDN page for array.reduce to get that whole slides information. Cool. Um, People see switch statements and they think, wow, I'm going to write a real application. Aren't I going to have many, many things in my switch statement? And the answer is absolutely. That's why Redux uh, provides a nice little function called combine reducers, which lets us take two different pieces of state. So think about state as a big tree, right? You've got branches. We've got the, uh, the to-do side on our application, which is really awesome. Uh, and then we have a counter. Side. So we've got a tree, it's got two branches, the to-do's over here and the counter over here. Cool, but these are in their own little worlds. How do we bring these things together? If you pull in the combine reducers uh, function from Redux, you then import your various reducers because they're just functions, right? Combine reducers returns a representation of your state with all that stuff smashed together. The key will be named to-dos, the key will be named counter, right? Using the object simple uh, key syntax there, right? So um, it makes it very easy to take an application, split it out into many sub pieces and then combine it all together and be given an, an entire representation of it. So we would then, for instance, in our application, uh, Take our store, take our full reducer now, okay, which combines both our to-dos and our counter together. And then we can say, okay, let's dispatch an action, and it's able to filter down and apply to the right piece of state that it cares about. Okay? Any questions on that? That's jumping through a lot of code really, really quickly. So far, so good? Cool. All right. Ah, yes. So uh, finally, we need to bring all of this stuff together essentially into a single master object that we can, we can ask for states and we can dispatch actions from, and that's the store. And it's just the central kind of um, switchboard for all this stuff, right? Uh, you, at any point, you can ask to get state and it'll give you the big blob of states, just a big JavaScript object. Um, you then use store, store.dispatch, to dispatch an action. And when you dispatch an action, the action, it's just an object that's got a key called type and then a payload. Um, you can then, and this is the important part, and this is where all the magic in React uh, comes from, you subscribe to a store and you say, I'm gonna listen on this particular piece of my state and when it changes, I'm gonna go do stuff, right? And this is how React has a very, very um, rapid responsive re-rendering based on state change. And you kind of see this down here in action. This is literally uh, raw JavaScript rendering. We're just gonna subscribe to our store and when any piece of data changes, we're going to rerun that function and just spit out that value right back into our DOM, documented element, we click it, boom, increment. That simple, okay? Sweet. That's it. Right? That's all there really is to Redux. And, and a lot of people kind of go, well, what else, what about the Redux, you know, what all the, the fancy stuff? That's fundamentally, if you've got that, there's some idiosyncrasies on top of it and there's some, some elegant levels to it if you want to get into those. But if you can kind of grok this stuff, getting a hold on the state of your application gets to be a whole lot easier. Um, big takeaways, uh, the concept of immutability. Um, I had to learn this the hard way on a lot of different projects before I finally figured it out because the idea of copying a big object and continuously returning it seems like that would be inefficient, but it is not in this mechanism, okay? So immutability just says you can never change it. You can only return copies with changed values, okay? Anyone using immutable JS out in the wild for real? All right. Um, what are... 
What are the, have you run into any limitations or performance issues with Immutable JS? There you go. There's really, um, from what I've seen, it, it provides some, some nice safety around this and prevents side effects. Cool. Um, pure functions we mentioned earlier. Everything that we're doing when we are kicking off these actions and we're running them through a reducer, they take in values and they return values, which means you can pull in your favorite testing library and pull pieces of your application state right off the stack and test it completely external to how it would render out to HTML. There's two sides to that uh, from a front end perspective. There's two sides that you can test. There's what is it state-wise, and there's how does it look? Like what is its representation as DOM? Two different sets of tests for that, right? But at least it allows a greater uh, granularity of testing that you wouldn't necessarily have before when you're mutating um, or when you're rendering out HTML directly. Cool. Finally, uh, this idea of higher order functions. So we are generating functions that generate functions and fling more functions around, right? That's that's a real real big tenet of of um, of Redux. You saw that combine reducers function in there. That is insanely powerful, right? You're giving it a whole bunch of functions. It's slamming those functions together and giving you back a brand new function that uh, understands the various branches of your state. Super, super powerful. Um, we get into things like uh, funks eventually, right? Eventually, you're going to want to have an action that calls another action. I don't know why they're called funks. I think there's a Wikipedia page on this. It's pretty cool. Um, but basically, right, sometimes you have an action that says, um, go get data. Well, that action needs to call is loading, needs to send an action called is uh, loading equals true, right? It needs to send the loading action. Then it needs to request the data, and when that action is done, it needs to set loading is false, right? Thunks allow us to do this in the realm of Redux in a very, very supported way. Um, so the first thing people bump into with Redux, Redux is that it's very synchronous, right? Actions come in the top, they get recorded, and then another one comes in and they all kind of wait for each other. If you need to do things asynchronously, you bring thunks into this, it adds a little bit of complexity um, with a lot of payoff. And finally, um, if you guys have ever seen uh, React Redux implementation, this is this kind of um, perfect case study of a higher order function of where we actually go and we bring in Redux as a higher order function. So real quick, we don't need to worry about the specifics of this gnarly React uh, component, but do note it's called dev landing and it's big and it's very dumb. It has no idea what Redux is, but it does have a function, a prop function in here called increment. Okay, and we're actually going to find it here real quick. There we go. There, okay. Hey, look. Hey, I press a button. I'm just being given a function called increment. That's all I care about, right? That's all this React component cares about. It has no idea what that function actually is. When we pull in Redux library called connect, a Redux function called connect, I have the ability to connect various pieces of data in my Redux store and actions that I have defined in my Redux store and then wrap it around my actual dumb React component. So if I have a piece of state called um, increment value or sum, okay, I can map this to dev count. So it's state.dev.sum, and my dev count that's actually sitting up inside of my React component can just be mapped to that directly. So you get to have this really cool state tree, and you get to have all of these very dumb React components that don't need to really super know specifics about your actions or your store, and you connect them together. And that's the thing that you return that you use in your application. And finally, that's it, guys. Um, thanks. Uh, there's lots of really good options here. Oh, hang on. Right. There we go. Um, these are some really great uh, articles and videos that really helped me get my, my head around immutability and Redux. Uh, there's a time travel um, 
time travel example, uh, when you are firing actions, you can rewind and fast forward actions in Redux very, very easily. The immutable data and React by Lee Byron in 2015 was uh, the very first thing I ever saw that really introduced me to um, a lot of really advanced data structures. Um, get into Elm, this is sort of your, um, your free hit of Elm if you want to try it and change your life. Um, Mob X, I include here because the Mob X and the Re React, or the Redux people love to call each other names on Twitter. Um, and two really awesome articles there at the end. I'm Chris Bloom. Thanks for letting me present tonight.